I woke up later than I had planned to, but I didn't feel particularly well rested. The sound of the monsters preparing for the upcoming battle was what had awoken me, and quickly helped me remember everything of the previous day. This being the final day of LARP, I knew that there was no time to waste. Getting dressed as quickly as I could, I was surprised to see that Hargel and Lith were waiting for me, serious expressions on their face. Out of nowhere, Lith said that he was glad that I had come to the LARP with him. Hargel nodded his agreement, and Lith continued on, saying how I had done so much for the sake of the House Cerberus, before I could say I was doing just what I wanted to. He started to remind me of how long ago the name we had chosen for our old adventure party was Cerberus, for no better reason than that there were three of us. Without me, House Cerberus wouldn't have even existed, he continued, saying that I was the one who had donated the Ring of Wish to them, allowing them to wish for nobility and the right to start a house. Even so, they had started House Cerberus with just two of them, and in a lot of ways, that just didn't make sense. Hargel stepped forward, as if they had practiced this beforehand, and said that I had provided great services to House Cerberus, far more than any other member had contributed. As such, it was unfitting for them not to recognize my services. Having me just as an honorary member had been fine until now, but with the upcoming battle, which might be High Cerberus's last, it was his duty to grant me full peerage. Lith handed him his sword, and realizing what was happening, I knelt down, preparing to be knighted. Hargel walked over to me, placed his hand on my shoulder, and told me to stand. Lith then handed me my sword, and as Harjo placed Lith's sword upon my shoulder, he told me to place my sword on his. We were to be of equal status, just as he and Lith were. After saying a few phrases, he stepped back and granted me the title of Baron Nephim Festiva of House Cerberus. He and Lith began to clap, and I sheepishly stood, not really sure what to make of the scene. I thanked them, and not knowing what else to do, I fished into my pocket, producing the three rings I had received the day before. I handed Lith the one with the sapphire, saying he'd never have to worry about me freezing his legs ever again, and he wouldn't have to worry about any other ice spells either. I then handed Hargel the silver ring, telling him what it did, and that he would have the important role of destroying the phylactery when we found it. After I slid on the ruby ring, we headed into the main room, where the monster leader was giving instructions. The battle would start in two hours. We needed everything to be ready by then. The monsters were busy putting on their costumes and memorising their stat cards, picking out weapons they felt comfortable with. Most would be Sheshniks, which meant that their costumes weren't particularly elaborate. When the monster leader spotted me, he called out for me to wait for him, and after he finished talking to the group of monsters, he walked over to me, asking me about my plans for my own actions during the battle. He didn't seem too happy, saying he preferred if I stayed in the back and helped direct the trips, playing it safe. I simply said that there were things I needed to do, and he'd have to trust in my ability. He nodded, a sign his confidence in me probably outweighed my own. He then asked if I was still willing to go through with the final stage of our plan. I said that despite appearances, it was still the best way of handling all sick. He nodded once again, and I couldn't help but wonder whether we'd be able to succeed. Throwing aside my uncertainty, I look around for Selena. I found her outside the cave, staring into the woods by herself. Ignoring that she may have been trying to avoid me, I walked towards her. Hearing me approach, she turned slightly to face me. It took her a moment to decide what expression to make, but she ended up settling on a frown before turning away from me, perhaps with the same stupidity of a man whacking a beehive with a stick. I said good morning and offered her to become my knight. She looked at me absolutely bewildered, not giving her a chance to get angry again. I explained that I had become a Baron of House Cerberus only a few minutes ago, and I was looking for knights. She looked at me, and I could see that she was trying hard to find some reason to be angry with me. After a moment, she said that she wouldn't be a knight, but a lady. Not bothering to say that usually lady referred to the wife of a knight, and that a woman who was knighted was called a dame. I chose to simply resubmit my offer, and I asked if she would become my lady. Ew, sorry. <laughs> my lady. <laughs> There was a moment where she realised what I said before I did, and she blushed dramatically, enough that I realised I was blushing just looking at her. Hoping to push past the moment, I pulled my sword from my back, saying that if she wanted to, I could knight her immediately. She hesitated, eyeing me carefully, feeling somewhat embarrassed 
I looked away from her, pretending to inspect my sword while waiting for her response. After a moment that likely lasted longer in my memory than it did in reality, she nodded, saying she would be honoured to become my lady. Happy for reasons I doubt I knew, I moved the tip of my sword to your shoulder, reciting a few of the phrases Hargel had used on me. I then tapped her other shoulder before telling her that she now had the title of Lady Selina of House Cerberus. She smiled. Back inside the cave, I informed Lith and Hargel that Selina was now officially a member of House Cerberus. Lith nearly nodded, but Hargel opened his eyes wide, staring at me in shock. Surprised by his reaction, I asked him what was wrong, and he said that he was just amazed that I had finally managed to propose to her. After I hurriedly explained that I had just knighted her, not married her, Lith started to laugh. Hargel, Selina and I all turned away embarrassed, all for very different reasons. Several of the monsters began to discuss the coming battle with us, and I was glad to hear that they were extremely excited. Usually, in these large battles, the monsters were always scripted to lose, no matter how well they fought. This time, however, they'd have an actual chance of really winning. For the first time ever at this LARP, I knew now why the monster leader didn't want to tell them just how weak they all were. It wasn't about the morale of the monsters. It was about not crushing this fragile, wonderful hope of finally achieving victory. Only then did I realise just how many people were involved. It wasn't just me against Ulsic. It wasn't how Cerberus against his squad. It wasn't even the matter of players versus monsters. It wasn't just a simple battle that would take place at a LARP and be forgotten. It was a battle that would be repeated again and again, endlessly forever. We were fighting a battle of vengeance, of liberation, a battle to open eyes and minds. There was hatred, yes, but that wasn't the only motivation. I wanted to protect my friends as much as I wanted to kill Ulsic. As much as I was ashamed of my hatred for that man, I was equally proud of how much I cared for my friends. As bad as my grudge was against Ulsic's followers, my respect for the monsters allowed me to act without regret. Even though I was angry at the players for not leaving Ulsic's side, I had not lost faith in all of them. A new sense of determination burning in me. I wanted to start the battle that I knew was nearly hopeless as soon as possible. The small flickers of hope I saw in everyone were providing me with confidence I couldn't simply claim as my own. A feeling that if we all tried hard enough, we might just succeed. Most of us ate breakfast inside the cave. Several of the younger monsters acting as a delivery service. After placing our orders, the four members of House Cerberus went to sit outside where we could see the road that eventually led to the inn. The mood was optimistic, though Selina seemed rather nervous, possibly because she knew just how weak the monsters would be in this battle. After a little while, Vlaine came up to me, asking if I still had the weapon ribbons I took from Rubido. Fishing the ribbons out of my pocket, I asked why he wanted them, and he said that I must have forgotten that Ulsic was immune to damage from non-magical weapons. Thankful that he had caught my oversight, I began to worry if I had forgotten anything else. While I fretted, he said that Thalandius Norwinter, the old wizard NPC he always played, could easily transmute a magical sword into two-handed one, and that if I really wanted him to, he could do it right now. Thanking him, I asked him if we'd go through with the whole motions, and he just said that if anyone asked, we did the whole thing yesterday. Tying the ribbon to my sword, I thanked him as he walked back to the inn, leaving House Cerberus to wait for its breakfast. After half an hour, I pointed out a group of people approaching, rather pleased to see them considering how hungry I was. To our surprise, it wasn't the courier monsters returning, but the group of teenage girls dressed in black. They didn't look particularly happy, talking amongst themselves irritably as they neared the cave. Noticing the four of us, they headed towards us, odd smiles appearing on their faces. The tall girl with a wide face offered a brief greeting before announcing that they wanted to join House Cerberus. We were only too glad to hear that, though these five girls were not my first picks in who I wanted to join us. I was happy just to know that some of the players wanted to help our cause. Hargel and Lith quickly started telling them about the process to join the house and started asking them a variety of questions. I listened for a while, but it was clear that Hargel was just enjoying making things seem complicated and official. The girls were looking at him seriously for the first few minutes, but when he had started to really stretch things out, they started to lose a little interest, whispering things between themselves while he continued to talk. Eventually one girl, the girl who couldn't walk without shuffling her feet, 
shuffled away from her friends and came up to greet me. I returned her greeting and asked what she had been up to the day before. After glancing at her friends and seeing that they were still pretending to listen to Harchill, he hadn't even noticed one of his audience has left, she began to speak with passion that made it quite clear she had wanted to tell someone what she had gone through very badly. She began saying how her friends' fortune telling and singing had been rather poorly received. They managed to entertain a few of the older men for about an hour, but eventually the merchant guild that ran the inn had told them that they needed licenses in order to try and make money inside of it. Her friends had spent most of the day arguing with the merchant's guild, who wanted five gold for each of their licenses, while they barely had a few pieces of silver each. She had kept trying to convince them to go out and adventure to make gold, but they just wanted to keep trying to convince the guild to lower the prices of the licenses. Eventually they ended up banned from the inn, and then had to try and argue their way back inside. Selena was eyeing the two of us as the girl vented her frustrations, but after making an indecipherable expression, she silently moved inside the cave, leaving the two of us while Lith and Hargill continued what was quickly turning into an elaborate ceremony. I told the girl that it must have been terrible for her, and that I was sorry she wasn't having a great first time at this LARP, as if it were the first time she had ever received sympathy. She started to thank me, saying that I was a great person. She then admitted that she knew everything about what I did yesterday, because an old wizard had told her everything when she had asked him about me. Wondering what kind of stories Flynn had been spreading about me, I was too slow in trying to change the subject of the conversation, and she continued, saying that it was amazing how I was so fair about everything. Reading the confused expression on my face, she said that I wouldn't break the rules even if my opponent did, and that I didn't care about the stats or position of guilds. Before I could say that that wasn't all true, she said that I fought against everything she hated at this LARP, and that I was everything she liked about it. As if surprised by what she had just said, she made a small gasp before turning around, heading back to where her friends were being inducted into House Cerberus, wondering about the odd way she had chosen to finish the conversation. I glanced around, managing to spot Selena's head before she pulled it back behind the door to the cave. After the girls became squires of House Cerberus, our food finally arrived, though I tried to escape inside where I could eat while discussing the battle with the other monsters. The girls seemed intent on telling me all the details of the previous day. While they weren't the worst company, I had slightly more important things to do than to listen how the older women in the merchants guilds were jealous of these girls' talents. Somewhat frustrated, I told them they should have gone out adventuring. Four of the nastiest looks I have ever received in my life shot towards me, though their effect was somewhat lessened by one face that beamed with happiness. The girl seemed more interested with talking to Lith after that, who seemed rather happy to be receiving all their attention. In a rather peaceful moment, I sat listening as the topic changed to matters unrelated to LARP, movies and books they had read and thought interesting. It was an odd feeling, as if I were detached from the world, the tranquility before me clashing with the turbo battle I knew was coming. Then, just when I had started to really appreciate it, the moment was swallowed up by the sound of the monsters emerging from the cave. The battle was starting. The monster leader, dressed in dark robes and carrying a spear and dagger, began to address the monsters. His speech was simple, only reminding them that this was not an ordinary battle, and that how hard we fought and the sacrifices we made would matter. He then asked for House Cerberus to step forward. We moved towards the front of the crowd, every monster staring at us intently. The monster leader simply nodded at Hargill, who began to speak to the crowd. Sometimes I don't give him enough credit, but in this moment, he shined. He didn't bother talking about the distant ideas of freedom or justice, but simply encouraged us to fight to the best of our abilities. He told us to forget our noble desires, or any virtuous goals we had, and to fight for our pride, to prove that our army would be stronger than theirs. He told us to be selfish, to seek glory, to ignore everything other than achieving victory. Hargill understood the monsters. This is what they wanted more than anything else. The chance to prove themselves without being tied down by some plot. Some of them let out war cries at the crescendos of Hargill's speech, which he encouraged heartily. At the end, people were roaring and shouting with volume that was sure to carry all the way to the inn. We moved out, ready for the first stage of our plans. We headed for a large field, peppered with a few small bushes. 
The monsters in charge of units began to position everyone loosely. A thin line of monsters with three-person groups spread out behind it. House Cerberus took its place at the very front, a formality that we would soon abandon as the battle began. We waited, but we didn't have to wait for long. The sound of the players coming made all the monsters grow quiet, and the silence from our side rapidly increased the tension in the air. The players arrived, marshalled by the noble houses, and assembled into the classic formation, a wall of shield wielders with a line of mages behind them. With the rule about charging, breaking through the wall of shield wielders required killing them, but they would be either replaced or healed rather quickly, leaving the wall intact. Getting past this wall to strike at the mages was the usual goal for the monsters, and one that rarely succeeded. Looking beyond the mages, I saw the large group that contained Ulsic and his followers. His seven guards were standing around him, and around them, Ulsic's sycophants, the fat woman, and the man I had killed twice last events among them. They remained behind the mages, Ulsic probably feeling rather smug about the impressive defences in front of him. As soon as the players reached their positions, Harjo began to speak, loudly and clearly. He listed Ulsic's crimes and demanded that the town deliver him to justice. He shouted that the lich's phylactery required human sacrifice and that he had deceived everyone. He then waited to see if Ulsic would respond to these accusations. Ulsic said nothing. He simply stared at Hargel, smiling, silently asking whether anything he had said mattered to the players. With a look of regret that was either genuine or excellent acting, Hargel said that they would have no choice but to seize him by force. Many people would die, he cautioned, and he asked if any of them would rather fight on the side of justice rather than iniquity. Spreading his arms out wide, he called out to the players, asking them to join him. This was their last chance, he warned, because as soon as the battle started, there would be no changing sides. Lith appeared next to me, handing me a long white ribbon, with one already tied around his arm. He then moved down the line, passing one to Selina, then to each of the goth girls, and finally handing the rest to Hargel. With a ceremonial flourish, Hargel tied a white ribbon to his arm before handing out the rest to the crowd of players in front of him. No one moved. The players were muttering amongst themselves, trying to decide what to do. The difference between the armies was readily apparent, and the inclusion of the teenage girls in the front of our army did not add to our display of power. Hargel did not waver, even as the moment stretched, until a full minute had passed. With great reluctance, he lowered the ribbons taking a step back as he did so. He then noticed movement from the far right. I turned my head, disappointed when I saw that no one had stepped forward. But just as I was turning back, I saw that people were parting the front line to allow the old man I had journeyed with to get through, his grandson and two other warriors close behind him. He took his time, hobbling towards Hargel, while everyone had become silent to watch. When he finally reached Hargel, he smiled at me as if to jokingly say, you owe me one, before turning to Hargel. With several unnecessary flourishes, Hargel handed him a ribbon, then handed one to his grandson and the other two fighters. A slow trickle of players started to head towards us. These were the people who didn't belong to any noble houses, who wanted to see something exciting happen for once at this LARP. As Hargel greeted them, I discovered that some were the old members of House Cerberus, and Harja was only too happy to see them return. Many of the players who remained on Ulsic's side started to jeer and shout, some even physically trying to stop people from coming over to us. But after 10 minutes, over 20 people had come to join us. Even with the monsters, we were still outnumbered, but no longer as dramatically. When it looked like no more people were coming, Harjo beseeched them one last time, saying that he would be unable to spare them any mercy if they remained. When it became clear that no one else was coming, he turned away from the players, looking happy but at the same time a little disappointed. The players who had joined us were ushered towards the back of our formations, where some of the monsters began to explain our plan to them. Before they could finish, the leaders of the noble houses started to shout, ordering their men forward. It became tremendously loud in an instant. People began shouting out damage and spells, and swords and shields collided. The battle had finally begun. Our line of monsters had large gaps spread throughout it, 
while the player's shield wall left no open spaces. When the two reached each other, they both stopped, observing the rule on no charging. After a moment, one of the players decided to take the opportunity that was directly in front of him. He moved forward, passing through the initial line of monsters without interference. The closest group of three monsters behind our initial lines started screaming at the top of their lungs, causing all the players around them to stare in shock. They rushed at the player who had broken past the line and surrounded him, attacking mercilessly while continuing to scream. The player fell almost instantly and the monsters stopped screaming, returning to their positions silently. This same scene repeated down the line. And after five players were killed in such fashion, no one else seemed very inclined to pass through the gaps in our line. These gaps were an important part of our strategy, as the mages behind the players' shields will cast their spells. The monsters had space to move and dodge, forcing the mages to waste their spells. There were spellcasters among the monsters, and the difference between the effect of their spells compared to that of the players was dramatic. The shield wall, with the players practically shoulder to shoulder, prevented them from being able to dodge. Their large shields were perfect targets, making even the most wildly aimed spells almost guaranteed to hit. Though the monsters had much weaker spellcasters, they were hitting with almost all of their spells, while the player mages were barely hitting with a third of theirs. House Cerberus had moved behind the monster line, except for Lith, who was right in front. The girls were all mages, except for the shuffling girl who had chosen to become a warrior. They were terrible, throwing their spells with terrible aim and only managing to hit because of the density of the shield wall. They supported Selena and Hargel as they all kept throwing spell after spell at the players. I was moving behind the monster line, attacking when I saw a chance, occasionally throwing an ice spell to pin a player. I remained cautious, keeping myself out of any real danger making sure to pay attention to the battle around me. Ulsic remained in the back, his guards all around him, watching the battle with only passing interest. His followers seemed eager to join the fight, but he seemed to be holding them back. With an army of players before them, without us even knowing where his phylactery was, he seemed invincible. I looked away from him and his grip, knowing that right now was not the time to even consider fighting him. Though our strategy was effective and the monsters were much better fighters than the players were, it was clear that the monsters dealt far less damage and had a lot less HP. Even so, more players seemed to be dropping than the monsters, their ranks becoming disorganised and gaps starting to appear in the shield wall. I started daring to hope that we might succeed with our goal in the very first stage of the plan, but Ulsic decided to make his move. He sent forward four of his squad Leaving behind three to protect him, they quickly moved to the front lines, splitting into two two-man teams. They walked past the monster line, ready for the screaming monsters that came at them. The monsters were quickly defeated, and the four men started to wreak havoc. In seconds, it started to look as if our front line would be completely shattered. Recognising that it was time to change to the next part of the plan, I didn't bother rushing over to meet them, instead instructing the monster line to start pulling back. As they retreated, they moved closer together, closing some of the gaps in the line. The rest of the openings were filled by our reserve troops, part of which consisted of the players who had decided to join us only a few minutes ago, and our battle line solidified. The four of all six squads saw what was happening, and not wanting to be cut off from the rest of their army, retreated back to all six through the last remaining gaps before they closed. It was time for me to head to the second stage. Our front lines were dwindling, but that had been part of our plan from the start. We wanted the players to know how weak the monsters were, so that they have no excuse for their loss. Now it was time to provide them with a nice reason for their defeat. As the monsters fell from the front line, they were pulled back and healed, but some of them did not return to battle. Instead, they retreated back towards the woods, to where a thin, unkept path snaked its way towards the next destination. Right now, we needed the front line to fight hard not for survival or victory, but purely for time. I moved in front of a particularly tall monster, hoping he would block me from my enemy's view. Once inside the path, I raced forward, praying that our front line would hold out. At the end of the path was one of the larger roads, and the 15 or so monsters who had retreated so far were all standing there, waiting. Not bothering to issue an order, I simply continued running, knowing that they would follow. 
The monsters retreating was a common occurrence in the large battlefields at this LARP. Usually it meant that the battle was simply going to change locations from one field to another, and the plot masters would inform the heads of the noble houses before the battle so that they would know where they would have to direct their trips. This time, however, Ulsic himself had not heard of a second location, and was likely expecting that the monsters who had retreated were simply the ones that had run out of times so they could respawn. The problem was that Ulsic knew I wasn't a monster, and more importantly, he knew I wouldn't retreat. It probably was better for me to stay behind with the rest of House Cerberus, but I needed to make sure this part of our plan succeeded. With luck, I'd be able to return before the front line fell. After a turn in the road, I finally saw our destination. While still a good distance away, I slowed down, and heard the people behind me do likewise. Without a single word exchange, half of them followed me, while the other half went to circle around the building in the opposite direction. Though most of the players were at the battle, there were certain to be a few who had remained at the inn. Carefully, as quietly as I could, I stepped into the entrance, looking around. After moving in further, I saw a few older women talking to each other, not bothering to pay attention to me. These were the heads of the Healing Guild, who rarely ever participated in battles. I moved around them, and I saw a few more players, sitting or standing, looking bored. The monsters burst in from all sides, and all the players started panicking, moving to block the exits. Thinking this was a full assault, while the warriors ran to grab their weapons, the monsters slew them without mercy. The older women began to cast spells, and I wasted no time in cutting them down. None of these players were particularly skilled fighters, being possibly the weakest fighters at this entire LARP, and I easily took out the few warriors that managed to reach their weapons. Only six other monsters had fought, but we had managed to defeat everyone so quickly that the rest of the monsters looked disappointed. As a group of monsters rushed upstairs to see if any people were up there, I surveyed the scene. Had they known we were coming and managed to keep us from entering, it could have been a pretty hard battle. Even though there were only about 10 players inside the inn, from the noise upstairs it sounded as if they had found more. It quickly became quiet once again. Moving to the nearest player, an overweight man who hadn't managed to reach his sword before he had been killed by a monster, I explained that we were going to move all their bodies upstairs. They all looked furious, and one of the older women started to argue. But one of the monsters said that they shouldn't have thought the inn was safe, and it wasn't the first time monsters had attacked it. After leading them all upstairs and leaving two monsters up there to remind them that they were all dead bodies and couldn't move, I watched as the monsters began to hide themselves. They kept close to the entrances, their main focus being to make sure that they couldn't be seen from outside. Several more monsters arrived, until around 20 of them were spread out inside the inn, with everything in place. I realised I hadn't really been necessary in this battle. Knowing I had to get back as soon as I could, I ran back to where the larger battle was hopefully still going on. I passed a few monsters, only stopping to say that there were enough inside the inn already. They continued down the road, heading for the woods that surrounded the inn. When I arrived in the large clearing, I realised I had been gone for much too long. The monsters were barely holding their positions, with most of the only surviving players that had joined us being the ones with stats good enough to keep themselves from being killed every few seconds. The old man was feasibly tossing beanbags at our enemies, calling out the same one damage fire spell I had, though I doubt anyone was taking notice. Lith had moved back to protect Hargel and Selina, who were looking tired but still casting spells as fast as they could. I rushed over to them, before I spotted the monster leader. He kept thrusting a spear one-handed into the shield wall, scoring hit after hit, occasionally using his dagger when a player tried to get past our front line. Rand was next to him, bent low with two short swords in his hands, striking at people's legs with rapid speed. The two were shouting orders, doing everything they could to keep our line from falling. Changing course, I headed towards the two of them, and with a shout I told them that it was hopeless, that we had failed, and that we needed to retreat. The monster leader turned to face me, in order to hide a smile from our enemies. He began to call for retreat, and we all started to move back. Hargill, with a well-crafted look of indignation, shouted at Ulsic that this wasn't the end and that we would return. Less than a third of our army remained in the clearing, looking tiny compared to the size of the player's army. We retreated into the woods, and it looked for a moment as if the players were going to chase after us. Some followed all the way to the edge of the woods, but none went further, 
and after a moment, the heads of the noble houses started to call back for everyone to return to the inn.